30, and we appear to have a pretty full audience today. This is Alex Mendenhall here at the University of Washington Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology's Laboratory Research and Discovery Seminar. Today, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Matt Haberlein, who's been doing aging research for over 20 years, but has been here at the University of Washington for the last 20 years, um, having his own laboratory for the last 17, I believe. Right, Matt? Yeah. So, um, and he's been doing a variety of rate of aging research in a variety of species um, from yeast to worms to mice to, I guess now even humans. Um, and looking at a variety of interventions that have slowed and sometimes seemingly reversed the aging process perhaps. And today he's gonna to be talking to us about uh, an exciting uh, pharmacological intervention in aging that's uh, conserved apparently from yeast all the way up to possibly humans. And with, with that, I will let Matt take it away. Great, thank you, Alex. I will <clears throat> attempt to share my screen. That looked good. Uh, let me put it in. Yeah, slide. got it. Almost Perfect. there. We go. All right. Great. Thanks, right. Alex. So it's a it's really a pleasure to be able to give uh, a seminar to uh, my home department of laboratory medicine and pathology at the University of Washington. And, um, you know, despite the encouragement I was given, so probably many of you know that I'm actually going to be uh, leaving my position at the University of Washington in a few or a few weeks to embark on a new adventure. And uh, a couple of people were trying to encourage me to, to, to go out in a blaze of glory. But um, really, I want to simply express my gratitude towards the University of Washington for allowing me the opportunity to um, develop both personally and professionally and, and to, to be able to have a lot of fun along the way. As Alex said, I've been here for 20 years, three years as a postdoc, and then 17 almost uh, running my own lab. And what I wanted to do today was kind of give a an account of a theme in the lab, one of many things that we've researched that has sort of ran through that entire, almost the entire 20 year period. And, and as you'll see, you know, I actually started thinking about mTOR and rapamycin while I was still working uh, on my postdoc. And it's been one of the things that has been an area of research in the laboratory from the very beginning. And so what I thought I'd do today is talk a bit about how that has matured, how we got to where we are today, and where I think that that this type of research um, will hopefully go in the relatively near future. Um, so let me see. So I want to start by, I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving an introduction to the biology of aging, but I do want to start by simply making the point that we have learned a lot about the biological mechanisms of aging to the point where I think we can say that it's starting to be solved. I certainly don't want to give the impression that we understand everything about the biology of aging. In fact, I would say with a level of certainty that there's much more we don't understand than we do understand. But we've gotten to the point where we can start to put names to a lot of what underlies the biology of aging. And I think the hallmarks of aging are a useful tool and concept to be able to do that. So these are the original hallmarks of aging. Those of you who are aging aficionados will you know, recognize that there may be a couple more depending on who you ask now. But the point is that these are highly conserved molecular mechanisms that seem to underlie the biology of aging in at least every eukaryotic organism where people have looked. And there are between nine and 11 of these and they're overlapping and interacting. And you know, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of today's talk, you know, what these things are, uh, at least you know, not in any great level of detail. But I do want people to appreciate that, that the field has matured to the point where we can start to get a handle on what are the mechanisms of aging. And one of the nice features of the hallmarks of aging is now that we can start to categorize these things, these actually serve as potential therapeutic targets that we can identify interventions. They could be lifestyle interventions. They could be small molecules. You know, at some point in the future, uh, they could be genetic direct genetic interventions, we can identify interventions to modulate these hallmarks of aging to potentially have a positive impact on lifespan and health span. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into any great, great depth, but if people are interested, 
There is a, I think, pretty good um, YouTube video that goes into some depth on all of these hallmarks as part of the American Aging Association Age Presents video lecture series, which is built around these hallmarks of aging. And I know um, Alex and, and Jonathan on have actually used that video lecture series in a graduate course that they teach on the hallmarks of aging here at the, the University of Washington. So if people are interested, it certainly would, would refer to that. Um, that video lecture series. So now that we're starting to understand the biology of aging, I would say we have an opportunity to really change the way that we think about human health and the approach to medicine. And I simply want to state that it is my hope and expectation that 21st century medicine will become medicine that really tries to keep people healthy by targeting the biology of aging. And uh, if you think about the greatest causes of death and disability in every developed country in the world, essentially all of them share age as their single greatest risk factor. And I think traditionally, because we didn't really have a choice, we have approached health by, by typically waiting until people are sick and then trying to treat their disease. But I think if we recognize that biological aging is really the underlying greatest risk factor for all of these declines in function, um, and causes of death and disability, and couple that with the fact that we actually have the opportunity to target biological aging because we're understanding it, then there's the potential to actually delay the onset and progression of multiple age-related diseases and disorders simultaneously. And as, as I said, it is my hope and expectation that we are at a point where this will become the paradigm in the practice of medicine and healthcare. We're not there yet by any stretch of the imagination, but um, but I think that's that's something to aspire to. I also want to just make the point, you know, we talk a lot about lifespan. I'm going to talk a lot about lifespan in my talk because it's something quantitative that we can measure and it's very useful in preclinical studies and the laboratory for that reason. Um, but I don't want to diminish the point that really for human aging, I think the goal, at least initially, is going to be much more about enhancing health span than it is about increasing lifespan. I think the opportunity is there to do both, but I think the lower hanging fruit in many ways is to push the diseases of aging back as far as possible into old age by targeting the biology of aging. And um, I just wanna, I wanna make that point explicitly that I think this is really where the first opportunities are going to be in translating from the laboratory into the real world, um, what, we, what we're learning about the biology of aging. So what do we know? And this again, I think represents a lot of progress in the field over the last couple of decades in terms of understanding the biology of aging and starting to develop interventions that can actually have an impact uh, on the biology of aging to increase lifespan and health span. There are many well-characterized genetic pathways that across all of the common laboratory model organisms, four of which are shown here, these are the four most common, I would say, yeast and nematode worms and fruit flies and mice. Um, across all of those model organisms, targeting these pathways increases lifespan. And to the extent that we can measure health span in these different organismal models, appears to also increase health span. And then there have been a variety of non-genetic interventions that I would characterize as lifestyle interventions or pharmacological interventions that seem to modulate the biology of aging in the same direction. And in fact, in many cases, we know directly some of these interventions target these same genetic pathways. So for example, I'm gonna talk a lot about rapamycin and rapamycin is a specific small molecule inhibitor of mTOR, the mechanistic target of rapamycin. So obviously there are connections between the genetics of aging and interventions that target the biology of aging. But in the laboratory, we've been quite successful as a field at identifying interventions that can increase lifespan and increase health span fairly significantly. Um, and it's now, I would say, pretty routine to be able to modify the biology of aging in laboratory animals to increase both lifespan and health span. And there are a variety of ways to do that and many, many labs that are studying uh, mechanistic uh, uh, approaches to doing this um, uh, in more detail. 
So that's in the laboratory. Now, what works in the real world? And this, I think, you know, if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm going to say I'm a little bit disappointed that we don't know yet, right? The, the reality is the things that we know can have an impact on health span and longevity in humans, you know, are, are not at least directly spawning from studies of the biology of aging. I think it is absolutely true that healthy diet, exercise, sleep, and other lifestyle factors that we know impact health outcomes during aging in people modulate the biology of aging, but we didn't discover those interventions from the biology of aging. You could make somewhat of a case for caloric restriction, um, given that caloric restriction was first shown to increase lifespan in laboratory rodents almost a century ago, so, so in the 1930s. Um, but, but all of these other sort of lifestyle interventions that clearly impact healthy aging in humans you know, modulate the biology of aging, but they didn't, they didn't come from discoveries that were made in research on the biology of aging yet. And that's going to be kind of the, the theme of the rest of my talk, which is I'm going to talk a lot about rapamycin, which I think may be the first small molecule intervention to come from studies of the biology of aging to actually have a translational impact on, on healthy aging in a provable way <clears throat> in the real world. I'm not going to talk about these other interventions, which probably many people have heard of, like NAD precursors, senolytics, metformin, alpha-ketoglutarate. There's a longer list. I apologize if your favorite potential longevity drug isn't on this list, but there's a longer list of potential interventions that, that could have an impact on health span and lifespan in the real world. I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on rapamycin because I would say, at least right now, that's probably the best bet we have uh, of the interventions that are that are at least known about at this point, and happy to discuss that in more detail during the question and answer period. Um, okay, so rapamycin is going to be the focus. Uh, what is rapamycin? <clears throat> I already briefly mentioned rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of a protein called mTOR. mTOR was actually named after rapamycin. It stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. Uh, this drug also goes by the name sirolimus. Uh, so if you uh, are primarily in the clinical world. You may have heard of sirolimus. It's exactly the same molecule as rapamycin. I don't really know why we need two names for the same molecule, but but that's that's the case. Um, and I've got the the Moai statues here uh, because rapamycin was originally discovered on Easter Island. That's actually where the drug gets its name from. Uh, Rapa Nui, of course, is another name for Easter Island. Um, and Rapamycin is interesting because it's been used clinically for a couple of decades. So it was FDA approved for organ transplant rejection more than 20 years ago now, I believe. Um, and so we have a lot of clinical information on the use of rapamycin or serolimus uh, in people, primarily for organ transplant rejection, although it is approved for a few other indications uh, restenosis and cardiac stents, uh, some, some rare forms of cancer, um, tuberous sclerosis, um, but primarily most of the clinical experience on rapamycin. And you'll probably hear, hear me use the word rapalog. That just means rapamycin derivatives. I think for the purpose of today's talk, you can think about them as they're biochemically almost identical to rapamycin. Um, uh, comes from use in organ transplant patients. Um, rapamycin is... Uh, somewhat unique from a biochemical perspective in that compared to most drugs, it is an extremely clean small molecule. To the best of my knowledge, there are no known off-target effects. It is a specific allosteric inhibitor of mTOR complex one. And I'll talk a little bit just briefly about mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two, but it is a very biochemically specific inhibitor of mTOR complex one. Having said that, um, chronic, higher dose use of rapamycin has been shown through, through secondary effects to lead to downregulation of mTOR complex two. So while it's biochemically very specific, there are indirect effects on other targets, including mTOR complex two. And that seems to be mostly in the context of chronic use at higher doses. Um, so one of the complicating things about thinking about talking about mTOR or rapamycin is that mTOR appears to be a master regulator of pretty much everything in the cell. Um, if you pick your favorite cellular process and do a PubMed search, I would be surprised if you couldn't find any papers linking it to mTOR. So mTOR has this sort of 
really central role in sensing the environment and helping the cell make appropriate decisions based on environmental cues as to whether or not it is a good time to divide and grow or a good time to become stress resistant and shut down proliferation. And that sort of central sensing and signaling role means that mTOR is interconnected with most of the major critical functional pathways in a cell. So that makes it challenging sometimes to, to, to think about, well, what is the specific downstream target of mTOR that's important for cell division, cell fate, cell death, metabolic effects or aging as we're going to we're going to talk about because it's so centrally tied into to many many fundamental aspects of cell biology and thereby tissue biology organ biology and organismal biology but the one thing i want to one one of the high level concepts i want to leave you with is i think mTOR is a useful regulator of aging and what I mean by that is that if we think about these hallmarks of aging, um, which is over here on the right, as I sort of alluded to, they're interconnected. And again, if you look at that YouTube video that I mentioned, it goes through in some detail some of the ways that the hallmarks are interconnected. And in my own mind, I sort of think of this as a network of interacting proteins and metabolites and microRNAs that are tying together these hallmarks. And that's really the biology of aging. And at a systems level, we understand that network very, very crudely. But I think one of the things we've learned is that there are nodes in that network that seem to be particularly amenable to modulating in a way that can have a positive impact on the hallmarks of aging and thereby aging biology writ large. And the readout of that is increased lifespan and increased health span, at least in laboratory animals. And from my perspective, mTOR turns out to be a very useful node in that network because we have learned that we can tweak mTOR genetically, pharmacologically in ways that have potent effects on the biological aging process. Um, uh, and as I've mentioned, rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of mTOR. And I do, I should clarify I'm talking specifically about mTOR complex one when I'm talking about the biology of aging. The vast majority of literature in this area is around inhibition of mTOR complex one, slowing aging, increasing lifespan, and increasing health span. Um, what's the downstream mechanisms? Now I'm going to go back to what I just said a, a couple of minutes ago. That's hard to disentangle because there's so much downstream of mTOR that is important for biology. And I think we've learned that it's probably not one thing that mTOR is doing that is tying together these hallmarks of aging. And so I've got six somewhat distinct processes listed here that, that in my view, are probably important downstream mTOR regulated processes that tie into the biology of aging. And the relative importance of these processes is likely different in different organisms and potentially in different tissues and organs in a complicated uh, mammalian system like humans or companion dogs. I will say in recent years, so I started in yeast as I'm gonna tell you in a minute, um, I, for, so for the first probably 10 or 12 years of my, you know, career in the aging field, I completely ignored the immune system because I started in yeast and yeast don't have an immune system. I have completely changed my tune, especially when we're talking about aging in mammals. And I think that uh, dysregulation of the immune system is certainly one of the more important factors that, that drives chronic declines in function in tissues and organs and age-related disease. And I think one of the more potent effects of rapamycin in mammals is through its, uh, its ability to downregulate inflammation and particularly sterile inflammation or autoimmunity, which we know rises dramatically during aging. But having said that, I think all of these functions are probably important in, in mammalian aging. Okay, so I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning and tell you about how I first got interested in, in mTOR. And um, so we were talking, this is, we're talking now 2003 to 2004, the very beginning of my postdoc uh, in genome sciences here at the University of Washington. Um, and I wish I could tell you that, that I got interested in mTOR because I was really smart and I was reading the literature and I realized that mTOR would be really important for aging, but that's not the truth. The truth is that I got interested in mTOR because Brian Kennedy and I were doing an unbiased genome-wide screen in yeast 
of individual single gene deletion mutants, simply trying to ask the question, which gene deletions increase lifespan? And we were very fortunate that the TOR deletion mutant was in the first 500 or so single gene deletion strains that we screened. And then we were secondarily fortunate, and I'll take a little bit of credit for this, for recognizing that that was important. Um, so we got, I think, 13 or 14 hits out of that first 500 and realized pretty quickly that because mTOR had this central role in helping sense the environment, particularly nutrient levels, that deletion of mTOR increasing lifespan might be telling us something about how caloric restriction was working. And at the time, you know, people didn't really know. There were some ideas out there, but people didn't really know what the primary mechanism by which caloric restriction was, was affecting lifespan, what that was. So we were very fortunate to come across mTOR, and then we recognized that that was likely important. And as sometimes happens in science, we had, we had no idea that other people were out there also converging on mTOR at the same time. But between 2004 and 2005, four different papers independently identified mTOR as an important genetic target in yeast, that was our work, in worms, there were two labs in worms, and uh, one in, in fruit flies. Uh, that was actually some work that Pankaj Kapahi, who's, who's now at the Buck, was doing at the time, um, that independently identified this pathway as being important through these sorts of unbiased genetic screens. So again, very fortunate to be in the right place at, at the right time. And so this graph here is actually the, the key figure from that paper showing that the TOR1 deletion mutants in yeast extends yeast replicative lifespan. So again, for those of you who aren't yeast aging aficionados uh, in the audience, this is a measure of mitotic aging. And what we're really measuring is how many times can a single mother cell divide before it undergoes cellular senescence. And so what's plotted here is the fraction of mother cells alive as a function of replicative age or number of daughter cells produced. And what you can see here is that the TOR1 mutant lived longer on average, both median and maximum replicative lifespan compared to the wild type control strain. And that's what we were looking for in our screen was single gene deletion mutants that had this interesting phenotype. Um, so then that work was published in science uh, a long time ago now. Um, and then the first uh, rapamycin longevity experiment uh, where, so that was a genetic experiment showing that genetic inhibition of mTOR could increase lifespan. I don't think a lot of people realize this, but the first experiment showing that rapamycin, the drug, could increase lifespan was actually done here at University of Washington. I was fortunate to be collaborating with a graduate student at the time, Trey Powers in Stan Fields lab uh, on this project to look at post-mitotic aging in yeast, so what's called chronological lifespan. And Trey showed that you could treat chronologically aging yeast cells and dramatically increase their chronological lifespan with rapamycin treatment. So that was actually the first experiment ever, to the best of my knowledge, showing that rapamycin could increase uh, uh, lifespan in any organism. Um, and this is interesting because, as I told you previously, we found that TOR1 deletion mutant increased mitotic aging in yeast. Now we've got a pharmacological inhibitor of mTOR, and we actually showed in the same paper that the TOR1 mutant as well could increase post-mitotic lifespan in yeast. So that now potentially gets pretty interesting when you're thinking about aging in a complicated animal like a, a mouse or a, a human, where we've got a mixture of mitotic and post-mitotic cells we found that this particular pathway was was it was an a potent regulator of longevity in both mitotic and post-mitotic yeast aging models in 2004, 2005, 2006. So to be honest with you, I don't think too many people in the field, you know, writ large, were paying a ton of attention. They thought, oh, that's interesting, but that's yeast. We don't really know how important that is. I think people really started paying attention a few years later when the, the NIA interventions testing program showed that rapamycin could increase lifespan in mice. And there were that was important simply for the demonstration that, that this now appeared to be conserved in yeast and worms and fruit flies. And now we're, now we're talking a mammal. Um, so we're getting, from an evolutionary perspective, much, much closer to humans. Um, so people started paying attention at that point. 
The other thing that I think was, was maybe as important, if not more important than simply the conservation of rapamycin that came out of this study was that they started the treatment in middle life. This was actually, to the best of my knowledge, the first intervention that was convincingly shown that you could start treatment in a middle-aged mouse, about the mouse equivalent of a 60-year-old person, and get a significant increase in lifespan. And so that paper was published in Nature in 2009. Um, David Harrison was the first author on that from the intervention testing program. And then Brian Kennedy and I wrote a news and views that accompanied that paper um, that kind of highlighted the point I just made, that this is really important, not only because it's showing that rapamycin can increase lifespan, but that you can actually have a potent effect on longevity starting in middle age in a mammal. And I think that kind of changed in, at least in my view, changed the way that many people in the field were thinking about biological aging. And from a translational perspective, you know, this is really important because it's much easier to envision an intervention where you can start treatment in middle age than it is to be thinking about an intervention that you have to start, you know, in teenage years, for example. Um, so I think that was a really a critically important aspect of that, that study. Um, and what we know now from, future, from, from subsequent studies is that you actually get most of the benefits starting in middle age. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a pretty wide dose response range for rapamycin. And so that's, um, that's shown here in both males and females at three different doses, all of which extend lifespan. Um, the specific, the actual doses themselves don't really matter, um, at least for the purposes of this talk. You'll note that it appears that rapamycin is more effective in terms of magnitude of effect in female mice compared to male mice. If you push the dose further, um, it seems as though the males can catch up to the females, although I don't think anybody has really ever done this in a uh, a very, very careful way to see, you know, where you reach that point, either of maximum efficacy or where the males actually catch up to the females. But this does seem to be a, a, a dose-dependent effect rather than a true sex-specific effect of rapamycin. Okay. So I would say today rapamycin is the gold standard longevity drug. So this has now been reproduced in I don't know how many labs, at least a couple dozen studies independently showing in different mouse strains, different doses that rapamycin can increase lifespan starting early in life, starting late in life, only treating early in life, only treating transiently late in life. I'll actually show you a little bit of data of that in a minute. Um, over and over and over again, people have shown that, that you can increase lifespan in mice up to about 30%. That seems to be about where it tops out. Although, as I said, nobody has really tried hard to figure out what the maximum uh, efficacy of rapamycin is in, in mice. Um, I already talked about how you can start it in middle age. I'll show you that transient treatments actually have some really interesting effects. And I wanna make the point, this isn't only about lifespan. Rapamycin in mice appears to broadly delay or in a few cases actually reverse functional declines that go along with aging and a partial list of the various tissues and organs in mice where rapamycin has been shown to improve uh, age-related health outcomes in mice is shown on, on right. So it, it seems to be the case that it is broadly impacting the biological aging process uh, throughout the entire body of, of mice. So the thing I think for me in the last several years that has been particularly exciting is, is what I alluded to a moment ago, which is that and this sort of surprised me because I don't think I would have predicted this when that first mouse paper came out, that you can actually improve functional measures of aging, at least in some tissues and organs, with relatively short-term treatments with rapamycin beginning in middle age, again, in mice. The four cases where I think that's been shown most clearly are the heart, the immune system, the oral cavity, and the ovary. I'm not going to have time to, to, to talk in a ton of detail, although I'm going to show you data for the first three. The ovarian function studies have been presented at meetings, but I, I believe at this point they're still all unpublished. There may be one on bioarchive, but there are at least a, a couple of labs that have shown rejuvenation of, of ovarian function in mice as well from um, late life rapamycin treatment. So I'm going to show this data. This is a figure modified from some work that came out of Peter Rabinovich's lab here at the University of Washington uh, a decade ago now. Um, looking at the effects of rapamycin on heart function in middle age. And so the, the study design here was um, you either have old mice or 
young mice, the old mice are 20 months of age at the start of the experiment. So again, roughly 60 year equivalent in a human. Um, uh, and they get either a vehicle control or rapamycin treatment for 10 weeks and echocardiograms at the beginning and end of that 10 week period. Um, and, and most of the parameters we're looking at, at left ventricular function. And these two parameters are left ventricular function. So how well is that chamber of the heart functioning? So there is a decline in left ventricular function with age. And I'll kind of walk you through this figure. It's a little bit complicated. So the two parameters here are left ventricular mass index and E to A ratio, which is uh, measured by echocardiogram. So first comparing the groups before the 10 week period. So if you just look at difference between young and old before the 10 week period, that's these open bars, there is a significant increase in LVMI with age and a significant decrease in E to A ratio. So that's a, that corresponds to a decline in function of the left ventricle contraction, contractibility um, with age. The other thing to appreciate is there's no significant difference between the mice that are destined to get rapamycin, but haven't yet gotten rapamycin because the treatment hasn't started. That's the open bars here and here. Okay, so then what happens over that 10 week treatment period? So if we look at the black bars now, this is the measurement <clears throat> at the end of the 10 week treatment period. So young mice that got a vehicle, no change in either parameter, that's what we would expect. Uh, old mice that got the vehicle, no significant change in LVMI, but there was in fact a significant uh, further decline in E to A ratio, just as part of that aging process. And then what happens to the mice that got rapamycin instead of the vehicle? And this is, I think, obviously the most interesting piece of this particular study, which is that for both LVMI and E to A ratio, after 10 weeks of rapamycin treatment, by these particular measures, they go back to looking like a young heart uh, instead of an old heart. So I don't wanna make the case that rapamycin completely rejuvenated heart function and it made the heart young again, but at least by certain measures of heart function, it's pretty clear that a 10 week treatment period in mice is sufficient to restore those functional parameters back to a youthful state. So I think it's fair to say this is at least partial rejuvenation of heart function from 10 weeks of treatment with rapamycin in a middle-aged mouse. And Peter's lab and others have gone on to characterize this further, start to dive into the mechanistic details. And we have some understanding for, for actually how this is working. So that's the heart data. This is now looking at immune function. And this is actually one of my favorite studies in the rapamycin literature. This is from uh, Pan Zheng's lab at University of Michigan, uh, published in, in 2009 where they were looking at the effects of rapamycin on immune function. And one of the readouts of immune function they used was the ability of the immune system to respond to a flu vaccine. So the design of this study is similar to the one I just showed you from Peter's lab with heart function. There are young and old mice. <clears throat> In this case, they either get a vehicle treatment or rapamycin treatment for six weeks. And then they get immunized with a flu vaccine. And then you wait two weeks and then challenge them with a dose of influenza that would be lethal if they hadn't got the immunization, okay? So I'll walk you through the data here. So the first group I wanna focus on are young mice that just never got the immunization. This is really the control to show you that, that this is in fact a lethal dose of influenza. So young mice, no rapamycin, no immunization, uh, that are then challenged with a lethal dose of influenza, now looking at survival after that challenge. And that's the solid line here that steps down and ends about eight days. All that's saying is that this particular dose of influenza is lethal and kills all the mice within about a week, okay? So now what happens if you're a young mouse that gets the flu vaccine? Um, I think for this crowd, it's safe to say vaccines work, and most people will believe that. Uh, in this case, the vaccine worked. So the flu vaccinated mice, that's the solid line here, 100% protection if they got the vaccination. So young immune system responded to the vaccine, full protection against an influenza challenge. Again, no rapamycin in that group. Okay, so now let's look at the old mice. All of the old mice get the vaccine. Half of the old mice get rapamycin, half get the vehicle. So what happens to the old mice that don't get rapamycin? 
That's this dotted line here that steps down until about 30% survival, and then it kind of flattens out. So what is this saying? What this is saying is that if you're an old mouse with an old immune system, there's about a 70% chance that that immune system is not going to respond appropriately to the vaccine, at least to the point where it confers protection against a lethal dose of influenza. About a 30% chance that it will. Uh, and that, that, those are the mice that are protected. So this is clearly showing a decline in immune function with age as measured by vaccine response. And I think it's safe to say that the same thing is true in people, although whether the magnitude of effect is this large, I think that that's an open question, at least in my mind. Okay, so now what happens to the old mice that got six weeks of rapamycin before the vaccination? You may be able to see it, you may not. There's a dotted line right here under the solid line, old mice plus rapamycin, rapamycin with immunization. So six weeks of rapamycin was sufficient to fully restore the ability of the aged immune system to respond to a flu vaccine in this study. Um, so that to me, I think is a pretty powerful piece of evidence that at least with this particular measure of immune, immune function, rapamycin is able to rejuvenate the ability of the aged immune system to appropriately respond to a vaccination. Okay, that's immune function. And then I just want to briefly talk about or the oral cavity and, and periodontal disease. So this is work that a very talented former grad student in my lab, Jonathan Ahn, who's now an assistant professor in oral health sciences here at University of Washington did, looking at how biological aging affects oral health and how rapamycin impacts that. And so John first came to my lab and showed that just as part of normal aging, mice develop clinically defining features of periodontal disease. And the three features that, that um, he quantified were loss of bone around the teeth, inflammation of the gums, so gingivitis, and pathological uh, uh, changes in the oral microbiome. Those are all seen in humans and, and are clinically defining features of periodontal disease in people. So we were confident that we could actually model periodontal disease in normally aging mice. And then John did a really interesting experiment where he treated aged mice with rapamycin for eight weeks. So again, very similar concept to what I just showed you for heart function and uh, immune function, but this time looking in the oral cavity. And in all three of these clinically defining features of periodontal disease, John observed that rapamycin could reverse those, those changes. Um, and, and, what, and this is published in eLife, so if you're interested, uh, I'd, I'd refer you to the paper, but one of the most striking ways to appreciate this is by these micro CT scans of the same animal before and after rapamycin treatment, where you can actually see regrowth of bone around the teeth. So, so again, this is another example, very different part of the body, right? where short-term treatment with rapamycin seems to be potent at reversing some of the pathological features of biological aging. And then the last piece of data from mice that I'm gonna show you um, is work that uh, Alessandro Bito, uh, who is uh, a former postdoc in the lab, now a faculty member in DLMP here at University of Washington did, um, Again, asking a very simple question. So I, I showed you some functional measures of aging. The very simple question that we were most interested in asking here was, well, what's the effect on lifespan from, from these transient treatments? We can see reversions of aged functional measures. Is there any significant effect on lifespan? And so this also is published in eLife. Again, I'll refer you to the paper if you wanna dive into the different doses we tested, the sex dependent effects. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. This is the group that had the biggest effect. So since I'm giving a seminar, I'm gonna show you the, the biggest effect size, uh, but there's some interesting dose response and sex effects in that paper uh, if, you're, if you're interested. This was male mice treated with the highest dose that we used for 12 weeks. And again, conceptually very simple. So 20 month old mice, give them a vehicle or rapamycin for 12 weeks, stop the treatment, put the cages back on the shelf and let them live out the rest of their natural life, right? So we're not intervening anymore outside of that 12 week window. And what you can see here is in this particular group, that treatment period led to about a 60% increase in remaining life expectancy from the end of the treatment. There are some interest, interesting pieces here that I think are worth just highlighting. The absolute magnitude of lifespan extension is actually bigger than the treatment period. 
So thinking about biological mechanisms that would lead to an outcome like that is, is kind of interesting to think about. And again, obviously we have no idea whether this translates to people or to dogs. If it did, just a linear extrapolation, that would be a couple of years for a typical seven-year-old dog or a couple of decades for a typical 50-year-old woman. So potentially pretty significant increases in life expectancy and lifespan from transient rapamycin treatment in, in middle age. Um, okay, so, so that's the laboratory work on rapamycin I wanted to share with you today. What about the real world? What do we know about rapamycin in the real world? And so I'm gonna briefly talk about companion dogs. That's is actually my dog. His name is Dobby. Um, and then I'll talk about some early data from studies in, in humans. So the, um, the work with rapamycin in companion dogs is being done as part of the Dog Aging Project, a large scale uh, multi-institutional longitudinal study of aging based here at the University of Washington and at Texas A&M University. Most of the dogs in the Dog Aging Project are part of the longitudinal study of aging. So we have about 44,000 companion dogs in the study at this point. The key goal of the longitudinal study is really to define the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence healthy aging in companion dogs. The rapamycin trial is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial to really try to answer the question, does rapamycin have an impact on lifespan and health span in companion dogs? And it is a relatively small part of the dog aging project cohort. Um, I'm running a little short on time, so I don't really have time to take you through the entire structure of the dog aging project. But just to give you an overview, I mentioned we now have about 44,000 dogs in what we call the dog aging project pack. Most of the data on these dogs comes from owner survey. So this is our comprehensive data tool, the health and life experiences survey. Um, and then we ask owners to provide electronic veterinary electronic medical records. Those who are able to provide eligible electronic medical records become eligible for what we call the sampled groups. And, and there are multiple sampled groups in the Dog Aging Project. Again, I don't really have time to take you through all of these, but one of those sampled groups is the clinical trial, which is called TRIAD for test of rapamycin in aging dogs. And I'll tell you a bit about TRIAD um, now. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention, though, is that the Dog Aging Project is an open science project. So this is one of our core values that we want to make the data derived from the Dog Aging Project open and accessible to everybody in the scientific community. Um, and so we published a, a, a paper in Nature uh, in 2002 describing the structure of the project. And if you are interested, if you're a data science person and you're interested in dogs, um, I would definitely encourage you to check out the website, dogagingproject.org. It's a very easy data use agreement to get access to the data. We know that there's going to be a whole bunch of really cool science to do on the data that we're collecting. Um, and that, that while our team has fantastic scientists, we can't do everything. So we really want to encourage people to take advantage of the, the open data, open science nature of the project. Okay, so triad. Um, triad is a, as I mentioned, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled, veterinary clinical trial of rapamycin in aging dogs. The uh, trial when it's fully enrolled will have 580 large middle-aged dogs. So the dogs have to be at, at least 40 pounds and at least seven years old, and they can't be sick at the time of randomization. So this is important. This is a study of normative aging. And so we really want to start the study with dogs that don't have significant pre-existing disease. Half get rapamycin, half get placebo. Uh, the dose is 0.15 milligrams per kilogram given orally once each week. I'm happy to talk about that. That doesn't, doesn't again, really matter for the purposes of today's talk. It's a one-year treatment period with two-year follow-up. And this is based on what I just showed you, which is that you can get pretty potent effects from transient treatments in, in mice, at least, with rapamycin. A couple of other points to make. The One of the key features of this trial is that lifespan is the primary endpoint. Um, that's kind of unique in clinical trials where you're talking about a normative aging population. As far as I know, it's the only clinical trial where lifespan is the primary endpoint in a normal normative aging population. But of course, we are very interested in health span and looking at a variety of secondary endpoints, including heart function, cognitive function, neurological function, activity, disease incidence, and the list goes on. Um, we have some preliminary data from two small clinical trials 
in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the preliminary data. I just tell you, we have yet to see any evidence for significant side effects, and that's important in many ways. A veterinary clinical trial is like a pediatric clinical trial. You really want to make sure you're not going to hurt anybody's dog, and so we are very pleased um, then at the absence of significant side effects and believe that at the dose we're using, that this is a very safe intervention to test. We found evidence for increased activity in both studies. This is owner reported, but the owners were blinded and some evidence for improved heart function. And that's, that's published. So if you're interested, I will refer you to the publication and I'm going to skip over the, the actual data. Um, this is just a schematic of the trial design. Again, I've kind of taken you through this. I want to make the point that the dogs have a, a veterinary exam at baseline, at which point if they meet the entry criteria, they are randomized into either the rapamycin treatment group or the placebo group. And then every six months come back to the clinical site for an exam, at which time we get either echocardiogram or neurological exam. We get a blood draw for blood chemistry, metabolome, epigenome, feces for microbiome, cognitive assessments every six months. We get activity measurements. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're trying very hard to track a variety of disease incidence metrics to try to assess whether rapamycin is in fact having an impact on health span. It is my hope that we will be fully randomized uh, by the end of this calendar year. As you can imagine, there have been a variety of challenges through COVID and, and getting the clinical sites set up. We're, we're, we have a pretty good process in place now and are randomizing dogs at a pretty good clip. This may be a bit optimistic, but I'm hopeful we can get fully randomized by the end of this calendar year, after which time it'll be three years until the last dog randomized um, comes out of the study, at which point we'll be able to unblind and hopefully have some, some concrete answers. Uh, this is just showing you our clinical sites at the moment. We are still adding clinical sites. Every dog paw here represents uh, a site that's already on board and roll up randomizing dogs or clinical sites that we are in the process of onboarding and hope to have uh, available for uh, randomization of dogs and screening of dogs in the relatively near future. Okay, so that's dogs. What do we know about rapamycin in, in people? So I talked about this long history of clinical use of rapamycin, that can tell us some things, but that's a pretty unique patient population. These are mostly organ transplant patients who there's a reason why they had to have an organ transplant. They are taking other strong immunosuppressants and are taking rapamycin at high doses. So in that context, there's no question rapamycin has some significant side effects associated with it. We don't have as much information on rapamycin use risks and or benefits in relatively healthy people taking other dosing protocols of, of rapamycin. This is an area that I think there's a need for more data. And I'll give you a little bit of information on some of the data that we've been able to collect. Before I do that, I do want to mention there is some reason to believe in healthy older people that rapamycin and or rapamycin derivatives can probably boost immune function similar to what I showed you for influenza vaccine response in mice. So there have been two phase two clinical trials done by Joan Manick with a derivative of rapamycin called Everolimus or RAD001. Again, it's a rapalog. Think about it biochemically the same as rapamycin, where they found in healthy older people treated for six weeks that there was a statistically significant improvement in flu vaccine response and a significant, uh, significantly reduced likelihood of subsequent upper respiratory tract infections over the next flu season. So it wasn't only flu infections, it was a variety of different types of, of uh, infections where there seemed to be a longer lasting, potentially longer lasting protection. Both of those studies are published, so I'll refer you to those papers if you're interested in diving into it. One point I want to make is they looked at side effects and they tested a few different doses at five milligrams of Everolimus given once a week. The side effect profile was very similar to placebo. So it, at least at that dose over this time period, it didn't seem as if there were significantly increased risks of, of side effects from rapamycin treatment. Okay, so then we have now embarked, and this is funded by the Impetus Grants, on a survey-based project to try to collect data from people who have been using rapamycin off-label, um, so it's prescribed by a physician, 
for potential benefits on health span and, and maybe lifespan. Um, and so we collected survey data from 330 people who identified as rapamycin users and 172 people who had never used rapamycin. This is just showing you the demographics. I'm not going to spend any time on it because they aren't really different, except the rapamycin users were about six to nine years older on average than, than the non-users. But I don't, I don't think that's super important. Um, there's a huge variety of dosing protocols out there. In some ways, it's kind of the Wild West. People are doing what they want to do for a variety of reasons, some of which are clear to me, some of which aren't. This is just now normalized to equivalent milligram dose per week because most people are taking rapamycin once a week off label. Not everyone, but the vast majority of people. Um, and you can see six milligrams once a week, at least for men and, and women, is the most common dose that's being taken off label, at least in our survey group. But there's a whole wide range of, of doses that, that people are taking. Obviously, that makes it challenging to draw firm conclusions from a study like this. But um, I'm going to do the best I can to, to at least show you what we learned. Um, the first thing we learned is that most people who are taking rapamycin feel very positively about it. That's probably not shocking, but these are several statements where the agree to disagree ratio was greater than five to one. Um, and again, the vast majority of people who are taking rapamycin off label think it's benefiting them. Now, take it for what it's worth. Again, maybe not shocking, but um, but that's that's what most people are are, are reporting. So then we ask, and so now I want to talk about some things where I think we can draw a little bit more concrete conclusions. We asked and compared people who are using rapamycin to people who are not using rapamycin to answer whether or not they had experienced any of these potential side effects within the last 90 days. And this is, you can see by the list here, it's pretty comprehensive, covers a lot of different parts of the body. We took this list from a variety of sources, um, including the manic papers that I mentioned and the side effects that they looked at. And basically uh, people were just asked, so you're the best of your recollection in the last three months, for each of these, have you experienced this? We only included in this analysis people who had been taking rapamycin for at least 90 days, because if they'd been taking rapamycin less than the recall period, that we figured that would complicate things. Um, so here's the results. And this to me was a little bit surprising. So this is showing you all of the statistically significant differences after false discovery rate correction. There were seven, and in only one of them, was it statistically more frequent in the rapamycin user group compared to the non-user group? And that was mouth sores, mouth ulceration. This is a known side effect of rapamycin. Um, in fact, it's the most common dose limiting side effect in organ transplant users. So this actually makes a ton of sense. And in some ways it's reassuring to see this come to the top of the list among the rapamycin users compared to the non-users. In all of the other statistically significant differences, they were less frequent in the rapamycin users compared to the non-users. Um, I don't really know what to make of this. There's some evidence for things like depression and anxiety in the literature. You can draw some inferences, but I'm not going to go there because I don't really know for sure what to make of it. But it is interesting that by and large, at least for the statistically significant, significant differences, if anything, you would say rapamycin appears to be beneficial in this group. Um, and I, this is just highlighting the mouth sores as the, the only one that was detrimental. So now if we look a little bit further down the list, we can start to see maybe what we would have expected. It just didn't turn out to be statistically significant in terms of a slightly higher risk of infection potentially in the rapamycin users. But again, if you look at the, this is now just going down the next most common uh, in terms of p-value. Um, if you look at most of them, they're actually lower in the rapamycin user group than in the non-user group. So again, the trend continues that, you know, even in these non-significant cases, it's hard to make an argument that, that there's a much higher risk of side effects in the rapamycin users compared to the non-users. If anything, it looks to go the other direction. Um, I should also say, obviously, this could be biased in lots of different ways, but I think it could be biased both ways. And in particular, People taking rapamycin off-label are often warned by their physician that it that they should be prepared for infections, and many of them actually get a co uh, 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 
prescription for antibiotics. And so I could imagine that they actually might over-report infections rather than under-report. So again, it's hard to draw too many firm conclusions about what that bias might look like. Okay, the other thing I thought was really interesting had to do with COVID-19, and I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, there was no difference between groups around risk of having had an infection with COVID-19. But if we look at people who had a COVID-19 infection and compare non-users to, there are actually three different categories of rapamycin users here that you can think about. People who hadn't started taking rapamycin at the time of their infection, people who took rapamycin prior to, but not during their COVID-19 infection, and people who took rapamycin continuously. And so if you analyze differences in severity of infection among those groups, there actually was a, a pretty significant, statistically significant and pretty strong difference between people who took rapamycin continuously and the other three groups towards a reduced likelihood of moderate or severe infections or long COVID. There were none of the rapamycin users who experienced long COVID and a few of the non-users who reported long COVID. And, uh, and this trend held up in males and females, but I'm not gonna, not gonna belabor that. So now um, just I'll just talk about, I think there are multiple anecdotal case reports that, that came out of the survey data. All of these potentially are interesting endpoints to think about with rapamycin going forward. And I think we're gonna learn a lot. So I'm pleased that there has been a trend towards starting double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials. The Impetus Grants program has been a leader in this funding clinical trial that John is running here at the University of Washington to look at periodontal disease with rapamycin and a clinical trial that Zev Williams and Yushin Su are running out of Columbia to look at premature ovarian failure in women and potential effects of rapamycin. I think this other area that's really gonna be interesting is the effect of rapamycin on muscle function in, in the elderly. So hopefully we'll start to get some, some clinical trial data to, uh, to start to answer some of these questions. So I just wanna finish up and mention from my perspective, some of the real uh, people who have made a huge impact on my time at University of Washington. And again, I have nothing but gratitude. I've been very fortunate to have fantastic mentors and friends and collaborators and, and teachers while I've been here. Um, I talked a bit about the collaborative work with Brian Kennedy when I was a postdoc in Stan's lab and also working collaboratively with, um, with Trey Powers. Clearly that set me on the trajectory that I'm that I'm still on um, and was foundational to my career. And um, Brian in particular continues to be one of my best friends uh, and, and has been a, a fantastic colleague and, and mentor for me. I also wanna mention a couple of uh, former pathology department chairs who had a big impact on me. Nelson Fausto was the chair at the time that I started my faculty position at UW, gave me my shot, which I'm grateful for. Uh, and Tom Montine uh, was a chair of pathology at a time when I was being heavily recruited to take positions at other places. And Tom was first a fantastic friend and mentor, but also was instrumental in keeping me at, at the University of Washington. Um, Peter Rabinovich, I can't thank enough for mentoring me from the very beginning. When I came here, Peter was the director of the genetic approaches to aging training grant that I was a, a postdoc on um, and, and obviously was running the shock center at that time has been, you know, a strong supporter of me throughout my entire career. And then last, uh, but certainly not least, maybe most uh, important, I want to mention, mention George Martin. I know George was a mentor to many of us, had a huge impact on the biology of aging as a field, had a huge impact on me very much a father figure to me. And I just love George to death and am still crushed that we lost George recently, as I know many people are. But I just want to thank George for being so important in my career. And I um, want to thank the lab. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, and this is probably last but least, in my opinion. Um, apparently, there's a QR code that, that students who need, I know I'm sure it's not least for the students, but uh, the students who are taking Path 520 need to get credit for listening to me talk. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. I know I've used most of my time, but I'm happy to hang out and answer questions uh, if people have any questions. So thank you for your attention. And should I leave this up, Alex, or should I take it down? Uh, you, you can leave, you can leave that, that up. Slot. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. That was that was amazing. I'm sure there's uh, going to be a ton of questions for you.
So everyone, you can uh, speak up or you can type your question in chat and I will um, pick that up. So uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Matt, I don't know. I don't think you mentioned this, but does Ralph Amiason fix gray hair? <laughs> wasn't that one of the wasn't that one of the things that or is so, that I'm misremembering? Yeah. So, well, so let me I mean, I think the real answer is I don't know. Um, uh, I think, so it's like I was talking before. If you look in PubMed, you can find you can find connections between mTOR and just about everything. So, yeah, I think there is some data out there on rapamycin and, 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 and hair graying. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't I haven't heard a lot and I've I've heard a lot from people who are taking rapamycin off label. I haven't heard a lot of stories of, you know, gray hair suddenly going going black. Um, so I wouldn't put that at the top of my list of things that I feel rock solid, confident, you know, rapamycin probably is, is impacting. Having said that, it's I mean, it's an interesting question. It is clearly an age associated phenotype. It would not be implausible that if you had an intervention that could reverse some molecular or functional aspects of aging, that it could impact hair graying, not necessarily rapamycin, but other interventions as well. Our, our, yeah, I, I believe our esteemed chair chimed in and Jeff said that uh, Gleevec can make uh, hair dark again, but it may be some uh, definition of some <laughs> metabolite. Thinking. Right, and that actually raises a good point that's probably worth stating explicitly. Um, reversing one age-associated phenotype does not necessarily mean that you have targeted the biology of aging, right? So obviously there are lots of cosmetic ways that we can reverse particular age-related phenotypes without impacting the fundamental biology of aging. And having said that, and this gets back to what I was saying about we don't completely understand the biology of aging, it may not be the case, even if you targeted, if you could, if you could target everything we know about the biology of aging today, that may not be sufficient to reverse every age-related process, right? There's a lot of complexity in the system that we still don't understand. Matt, I've got one uh, from Samsung SMA528B to everyone that says, thanks, Matt. Are there any other chemicals that work as well or better than rapamycin for life and health span? No, not right now. Not that we know about. I mean, there might be people out there who will disagree with me, but I think if you're, so if you're only looking at the preclinical data, which is really the only place we can look where we have quantitative data on lifespan and health span, um, rapamycin is the gold standard, at least for, for small molecules. You could have a debate about caloric restriction. Caloric restriction clearly can extend lifespan to a larger extent than rapamycin. So the longest percent lifespan extension I'm aware of is about 60% with the 60% reduction in caloric restriction. What's often not talked about is caloric restriction is actually quite harmful in many genetic backgrounds, maybe up to a quarter or a third of genetic backgrounds. So, you know, what the ultimate utility of that is, I think we don't know. Probably also worth mentioning, even in mouse studies, we don't have a lot of information yet on rapamycin effects across a wide range of genetic backgrounds. Undoubtedly, there will be genetic interactions with rapamycin, but we only have studies in, a, in three or four different genetic backgrounds at this point, where at least to the best of my knowledge, it has always extended lifespan, but there certainly may be genetic backgrounds where rapamycin doesn't extend lifespan and could even be harmful. I have a question. Um, so looking at your, um, looking at the analysis that you did with the rapamycin off-label users versus non-users, I was curious where the non-users came from, because I think one of the things that always um, confuses me or concerns me about the off-label use is that I think it represents a population of people that have a pretty high level of access to healthcare, yeah. right? And so these are people that have money and time to kind of go do some extra things about aging. Yep. Um, yeah, it's a, so it's a it makes me wonder. Yeah, great question. And again, this this study has all sorts of limitations. So that that's one of many. Um, so what I can say is the the off label users, or sorry, the the non rapamycin users were recruited through the same the same mechanisms mostly. A lot of that was social media, Twitter, Facebook pages, things like that. Um, with the exception that many of the rapamycin users were also recruited through doctors who prescribe rapamycin off label and their patient list. So there was a difference there. I think if you look at the way, and this isn't everything that we asked, but if you look at the demographics, there's a healthy cohort bias in both groups here. Um, I certainly don't think if you were to ask the typical American if they exercise regularly, that it would be above 80%, right? Answering yes. 
So there is a healthy cohort bias, access to medical care, absolutely, probably. Yeah, and your BMIs as well. Yeah, right. So, mm -hmm. but it's not different between the two groups, which I guess is probably the best that we can kind of hope for in a situation like this. Whether you could extrapolate this to the average person, I wouldn't even go there. Like, I don't yeah. think we want to go there at this point. So it's a, absolutely a good point. Yeah, I think, I guess, I guess it's more, I'm, and then just one more comment and then I'm done, but I think it's more for me, it's people that that want to use that access that they have additionally, right? Like that it's a subset of people that want to do something about their aging, whether yeah. or not that both groups have equal access. So that's it. Yeah, good point. Um, Matt, I think we have a couple in chat here. So uh, Maylee, to everyone, uh, what are your thoughts on the ITP showing out of the benefits of a carbos with metformin with or of out of the benefits of a carbos and metformin with rapamycin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Just for background, because not everybody is going to be up to date on on the ITP. So the interventions testing program, which I mentioned, was the first to show rapamycin can extend lifespan in mice. This is an NIA funded program that's been going now since 2005, so almost eight, 18 years, almost 20 years, um, where anybody in the scientific community can submit an intervention, which is then reviewed and selected for testing for lifespan in mice at three different sites. So it has built-in triplicate replication across sites. And they have found a small number of interventions that can increase lifespan. Um, rapamycin is the, the most, the largest effect and the one that has been shown to, to be most robust and reproducible, um, but there have been a few others. And acarbos is one of them. So acarbos is a uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitor. It's a it's kind of you know third line anti-diabetic drug. It's not used that commonly in the United States, but it has been shown to robustly increase lifespan in male mice, but not female mice through the ITP. And the ITP has asked the question. What happens if we combine acarbos with rapamycin? And the initial results are consistent with a, I don't know if it's completely additive, but a bigger effect from the combination than either drug alone, suggestive of some potential additivity. Um, they've also done this in combination with metformin, which is the number one prescribed anti-diabetic drug in the world. Metformin on its own has essentially no effect on lifespan, at least in the ITP studies. But when combined with rapamycin, it looks like the metformin plus rapamycin might live a little bit longer than rapamycin alone. The weakness to both of these studies is the, the appropriate, the best controls weren't built into the same experiment. In other words, there wasn't dose-matched rapamycin or acarbos or metformin alone cohorts. All of those weren't in the direct comparison groups. So we're forced to compare to historical data to really try to get a feel for additivity. So I would say, I would characterize those results as suggestive of additivity, certainly not negative synergy or no negative effects from combining them. I'd really like to see more careful studies with all of the right controls built in to really make a strong claim around added benefits from combining the two. And I'll just, I'll just finish up because I know I've gone on for a while by saying that Metformin plus rapamycin is also potentially interesting because at least in organ transplant patients, one of the side effects of rapamycin is a pseudo diabetes like phenotype. And there has been some speculation that metformin could potentially offset that pseudo diabetes like phenotype. So there could be another reason for combining metformin with rapamycin. Again, all sorts of assumptions built into that, but, but that I think is, is worth mentioning for that reason. Matt, we have a couple more questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yep. Shoot. Okay. So, uh, Sylvia Sisek uh, asked recently, the results of clinical trial were released on cats with HCM showing the illness stopped progressing or even was partially reversed. Do you happen to know if the dosing or if dosing was similar to your dog study? Uh, great question. So, I... I, I I probably have that information, but I don't know off the top of my head what the what the equivalent dosing is. What I can tell you, so that the 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 trial that you're referring to, I actually am not sure if that paper's out, but I saw a press release or a news release they presented at a conference. That actually is being done by a company called Trivium Vet. That is a veterinary formulation of rapamycin specifically for veterinary use, and it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And yes, the results, initial results look look quite impressive. Um, 
we are using that same formulation in our dog study. I'd have to go back and look at the dosing, the, the dosing equivalencies. And even then I would say, you know, on a MIG per kig basis, it's probably not fair to try to go from cats to dogs anyway. But um, but I don't I don't know off the top of my head the answer to that to that question. But it is the same formulation of rapamycin. Thanks, Matt. Um, Chihiro Morishima asks, can you elaborate more on the immune effects of rapamycin taken at the doses thought to be beneficial and how this relates to longer lifespan? So I, I, I could, um, it would be completely speculative in, in humans, right? So again, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, right? So, so, so rapamycin is immunomodulatory, no question about it. That's absolutely true at organ transplant doses. doses. I think the, the initial data that we're seeing, even from our survey data, is consistent with immunomodulatory effects both directions, right? Maybe a slight increased risk of bacterial infections, maybe protection against viruses. That's pretty speculative, though, just based on this data. So what I would say is, um, I think, I think one of the one of the main effects, and I talked about this briefly early on in my talk, of rapamycin for functional measures of aging has a lot to do with its ability to tamp down on sterile inflammation that is happening during aging. And the causes of that sterile inflammation are multifactorial. One of the causes is the accumulation of senescent cells, which give off inflammatory markers, inflammatory cytokines. Rapamycin, we know, is quite potent at knocking down that activity of senescent cells, but I don't think that's the only way that rapamycin is affecting immune function in the context of aging. And I would also say that this is where dose probably becomes really important. There is certainly going to be a dose of rapamycin that is immune suppressive and will increase risk of infections. There might be a dose of rapamycin that is not substantially immune suppressive that still gives some of these benefits in terms of its anti-inflammatory effects and maybe other things that rapamycin does in terms of upregulating autophagy, affecting mitochondrial function. Um, that remains to be determined. And so I think this is a big challenge going forward. Uh, and this is true, not just for rapamycin, but for all of these interventions that people are trying to think about moving forward into the clinic uh, to target the biology of aging is finding the right protocols to maximize benefits and reduce risk. And this gets into, I think, a more complicated discussion around what is the appropriate level of risk for an intervention that might have a positive impact on health span, right? Because we're talking in some cases about treating people who don't have overt disease. And I think the gut reaction to many people is no level of risk is tolerable in the absence of disease. I would personally disagree with that, but I think that's a larger discussion that, you know, that needs to happen to really appropriately evaluate why, what the right risk reward equation is, not just for rapamycin, but for all of these uh, potential geroscience interventions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, someone asked, uh, Christer Kaupi asked, uh, has there been done any lifespan studies on rapalogs? If not, why not? Great question. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if any have been published. There was unpublished da data out there on Everolimus extending lifespan in mice. I should know this. I'm sorry that I don't. I'm not sure if that was ever published. I will say that the failure of the field to explore other small molecule mTOR inhibitors is a big gaping hole in the literature. So there are a whole class of couple of different classes of mTOR inhibitors that are not rapalogs, that are active site inhibitors or ATP competitive inhibitors that are, that are actually being developed clinically that haven't been tested for their effects on aging lifespan or health span in laboratory animals. And they might work better than rapamycin. We just don't know. So this is a, this is a, you know, as I said, gaping hole in the literature that, you know, I think all of us in the field have some responsibility for. I'm just going to blame the funders because I've tried to get funding to do it and and failed to appropriately make the, the case. But um, yeah, it, I wish it had been done. I wish we knew the answer to that. Matt, rapamycin is a type of antibiotic. Do you have any data other that other type of antibiotics work in a similar way? Hmm. So rapamycin is an antifungal. I think to the best of our knowledge, it does not affect bacteria. So I think it's important to make that um, distinction. So, you know, there are going to be antibiotics that are going to kill off 
wide swaths of bacteria that don't hit fungal species. There could be antifungals like rapamycin that have antifungal activity that don't hit bacteria. And then they're going to be antibiotics that kill everything, right? They're just non-discriminate. Um, so I don't know data on longevity for other antifungals. It's possible. It's likely there's some out there. I can't pull anything out of my head at the moment. Certainly nothing that looks to be comparable to uh, rapamycin. I think it's an interesting question whether the antifungal effects of rapamycin play any role in some of its health benefits, both in the gut microbiome and the oral microbiome. I briefly mentioned in passing that we saw remodeling of the oral microbiome age-related changes in the oral microbiome with rapamycin treatment. It's quite possible that the effects of rapamycin on the microbial community are important. We don't know. Um, and then there is some unpublished data um, uh, on antibiotics having some interesting effects in the context of uh, uh, age-related phenotypes and aging. I don't, again, think if there's anything published that's got a really strong effects, but it wouldn't shock me if antibiotics and you know, effects of antibiotics on our microbial communities, the gut microbiome probably most notably, but other microbial communities as well, could impact the biology of aging in pretty profound ways. Thanks, Matt. I got a couple more if you're up for it. So sure. this one, I think you'll like. Brian Chico uh, asked, hey, Brian. which animal models do you think provide the closest, best, most transferable results for rapamycin studies, dogs or Marmosets as Adam Salmon is using. Yeah, I think it's a good question. And I think you can make a case for either. The place where I, so marmosets of course are non-human primates, right? So that, that, that puts them closer evolutionarily to humans. I would say the big advantage that dog companion dogs have, if your goal, so there's two. One is if we can significantly impact health span and lifespan in companion dogs, I'll be happy. Like. I'm not, I'm not gonna say I don't care about what effect it has on humans, but that's a big deal in and of itself. The other is companion dogs share the human environment. So the thing to realize is all of the preclinical literature that we are basing most of what we think we know about the biology of aging on is done in laboratory animals, which are in a very, very controlled environment and they're usually inbred. So there's a lot of um, potential limitations to doing studies in that context. Companion dogs are genetically diverse and they are environmentally diverse and in with the exception of diet really match the human environment quite well and and so that's why i would say i personally would put dogs a step above non-human primates in the laboratory even if your interest is solely in what is how is this going to be relevant to humans because i think that environmental piece is a big black box again that's kind of a, a hole in the literature that that the field hasn't really addressed and we know environment's going to be important for longevity and health span so so that's where i would say dogs companion dogs really have a a, a leg up so to speak uh matt okay we, when can we expect preliminary results from the triad study from kevin yeah, so I gave you my optimistic timeline. I mean, again, we're we're blinded, right? So we're not going to unblind until the last dog comes out of the comes out of the study. There will be an interim analysis. You know, I we've talked about this. So the typical way an interim analysis is done, right, is you do you do interim analyses, and what you're looking for is either some evidence that the treatment is harmful, in which case you would stop the trial if there's a clear harm being done or some evidence that the treatment is working so well that it would be unethical to withhold the treatment from the placebo group, right? So I, we've talked about whether in our case, let's just say the interim analysis says, yeah, rapamycin is great. Everybody, every dog should be taking it. Would we unblind at that point? Probably not. Just given the nature of this trial as a healthy aging trial, we probably wouldn't. So, I mean, I think realistically, it's going to be four years. I, I wish it was shorter. Look, I know you guys are frustrated by that, you're not nearly as frustrated as I am. I, I wish that we were further along, but I think we're just going to have to wait for the right answer, right? We, it's better to do the study right and wait for the answer than it is to try to rush to, to get data. So I think that's probably what it's going to take. Okay, uh, Matt, do you think the that it's possible that the rapamycin will be FDA approved for longevity use for humans? So I, I don't want to say never. Um, and again, I think this is a bigger question than just around uh, rapamycin. I can't predict the future. I, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. And I don't think, and and 
you know, this question may also be coming from the framework of a lot of people are arguing that we just need FDA to define aging as a disease, and then we can do clinical trials for aging. No, I'm sorry. That reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of how FDA works. You need to have quantitative endpoints that you can measure that they believe are reflecting quality or quantity of life for people. So even if we defined aging as a disease and FDA said, yep, aging is a disease, you still got to have a way to measure aging in order to get your intervention approved. So, you know, that could evolve as biomarkers eventually being recognized as surrogate endpoints. I think we're still a ways away from that, especially given what I know about the current state of biomarkers and aging clocks in the field. But maybe someday, maybe hopefully it won't be too long before we have surrogate endpoints where you can use biomarkers or people are gonna design clinical trials with quantitative endpoints that are reflective of aging pathology, aging function, aging disease that they can measure and show an improvement. Because that's what you're gonna to have to do to get your drug approved by FDA, at least under the current framework. There are some things going on behind the scenes that I think, I don't think it's gonna change that, but I'm hopeful might change the incentives for people companies to do geroscience clinical trials. And I think that could have a big impact on accelerating the FDA process around geroscience interventions. But I don't think the endpoint is going to be lifespan. And I don't think the endpoint is going to be aging. It's going to have to be something that you can actually measure quantitatively. That's my in intuition at this point. Okay, um, let's see here. We have Matt, are you still up for a couple more questions? We still yeah. have a lot of people. Okay, so let's do it. Um, all right, cool. Chat. Does this take the place of my exit interview, Alex? I think so. I think this is the exit <laughs> interview. Um, Kevin also wanted to know about the dog longevity project, and uh, Dan Yaff wants to know about the vehicle used in the rat and the mice studies to deliver the rapamycin and the mice. And those are the two last questions we got for now. Okay, so let me take the mouse uh, question first because I honestly don't remember what was in that, what was in the vehicle. It was the, so basically um, rapamycin is very hydrophobic. So you have to solubilize it and there's a little bit of detergent and, and solubilizing agents that, uh, that the rapamycin is dissolved in. So at least for the highest doses. This is actually a good question. So we so we used two different ways to dose rapamycin in that study. One was in the food, and that's the encapsulated rapamycin formulation that the interventions testing program has used. So the vehicle for those experiments was the encapsulation material with no rapamycin in it. For the experiments where we did IP injection, the vehicle was the solubilizing agent with no rapamycin in it. And I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what that agent was, but it's in the paper if, if, if you're interested in, in going back to, um, to find that. Um, so then the dog longevity project, I'm not sure, I, I wanna make sure I understand what is being referred to there. So, so I assume that it, that's not the dog aging project, which I talked about, which I'm involved in. I'm not sure which dog longevity project this question is, is referring to. So I don't wanna to try to answer without knowing what I'm talking about. I do that sometimes, but I prefer to not do it today. So if whoever uh, asked that question can provide context, that would help. Yeah, that is from Kevin. Oh, and I guess we skipped, uh, so, Shakiro Morishima, I missed um, Samsung's question about NSAIDs, so uh, on reducing age-related inflammation. Yeah, so, so that's interesting. I mean, I think absolutely there are reasons to believe that NSAIDs, I mean, definitely they can reduce inflammation and that they may be effective in the context of reducing age-associated sterile inflammation and improving health and, and function through that mechanism. Um, I think we also know that long-term chronic use of NSAIDs have a whole host of, of potential problems that may offset any benefits. And at least to date, the data on NSAIDs for lifespan in preclinical studies has not shown certainly nothing close to the effects of rapamycin. Aspirin, which is not an NSAID, but sort of similar uh, class, I guess, of, of intervention does have a small effect on lifespan out of the intervention testing program. And again, that may be through anti-inflammatory mechanisms. It may be through other mechanisms, but I'm not aware of any data in mice 
impressively showing longevity benefits from NSAIDs. But again, you know, the field is growing so rapidly. That's why I keep saying I'm not aware. I used to be comfortable saying nobody's ever done that. And now it may be that there's a paper out there that I either didn't see or, or didn't remember, but I'm not aware of any data suggesting that at least in preclinical studies, NSAIDs are as potent as rapamycin is for longevity or health span. Um, okay, Matt, I've got uh, sort of a bioethics question for you here. So uh, let's see, this is Samsung asks, what are your thoughts about the lifespan project financed by Saudi Arabia? Ah, evolution. That that's what he's that's what's being referred to. So again, for for people who are not who don't know about this, Evolution is a new uh, foundation that is fully funded. Well, not fully funded, but mostly funded by the the Saudi Arabian government. They have committed to putting a billion dollars a year towards biology of aging research, running from preclinical all the way through to to clinical trials. Uh, uh, nonprofit academic work all the way through to companies. Um, so that's just a fact. I'm not putting my my opinion on that. That's just what what is the case. So I think what the person's asking is how do I personally feel about about evolution? Look, I, I think that this is a this is a complex issue. I understand why many people have reservations about taking money from a foundation funded by the Saudi government. I also understand that that there are many other sources, that people routinely take money from that have questionable, you know, features to their past and ongoing activities. So I think that this is really a personal decision that individuals need to make about whether or not, you know, they are going to accept funding from Evolution. I will say personally, I feel that this is a good thing for the field and it's a good sign for the field that there are resources coming into the field. I have said publicly for many, many years that it is a travesty how little money NIH puts towards the biology of aging, given the importance of the biology of aging in what NIH is supposed to care about, which is human health. I already told you this is the single greatest risk factor for every major cause of death and disability almost in the United States. And yet less than one half of 1% of NIH funding has gone to the biology of aging. So that is um, disgusting, in my opinion. Uh, I hope it changes in the near future, but it hasn't. And so I think it's a good thing for the field that some resources are actually being put towards this problem. If Evolution actually spends a billion dollars a year on biology of aging, that will quadruple the amount of money going to biology of aging research overnight. So I'm pleased from that perspective, regardless of the source of the money. Matt, uh, thank you. Let me double check that we don't have any other chat messages here. Um, I think you're all caught up. So unless anyone else has anything, I'd like to say thank you to Matt and thank him for being a great colleague and mentor. And it's, it's been a great ride, Matt. We're all going to miss you. Um, and I'm not dying. No. Still no. be around. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Eric, Eric, so you got one last one. This is your... Can you share your plans for the future, Matt? Sure. So I'm going to a startup called Optispan, and I don't want to go, go into the, all of the details of what, what we're doing at Optispan, but one of our, I would say our defining mission is really to facilitate what I, what I kind of talked about at the beginning, which is the adoption of 21st century medicine from the perspective of trying to keep people healthy instead of waiting until people are sick. And our vision for for how, how we're going to contribute to that is in part by creating a toolkit of science-based approaches to target the biology of aging and prevent disease. So we're not ignoring all of the powerful diagnostics that are out there, but create a toolkit that will help providers actually be able to do this in a science-based and as friction-free as possible way and bring that to their patients. And we think that you know, the healthcare system is going to have to change at some point. And we think that we can play a role there and we want to help try to have a positive impact. So that that's what I'm that's what I'm going to do with the next phase of my career. I want to make a difference there because I think it's important. Thanks, Matt.
Well, uh, we're all excited to see what you do next. And uh, with that, if, unless there's anything else, we'll uh, sign off. And thanks again, Matt. That, that was yeah, terrific. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone.